Thank you for having me. This is really exciting and it uh, gave me an opportunity to put a lot of thoughts and things that are going on in the world onto paper. So I'm really excited to share some insights with everybody today. Uh, I'm, I'm Diane Bailey. I'm uh, currently with Founder Institute as the director for the Colorado chapter here in the U.S. Founder Institute is the world's largest pre-seed accelerator. We help founders at the idea stage to a few thousand MRR in revenue, but they're all pre-institutional funding. So through our program and our 16-week 16 16-week 16 accelerator, we walk founders through all of the foundational steps in order to get investor ready. Uh, I've also taken on a role too outside of Founder Institute to help founders with their pitch decks so they can become uh, more competitive. We'll, we'll see that theme in, in the presentation because I, I, I'm sure I'm not alone in seeing some very interesting decks out there. So really trying to make sure that founders are presented the best they can when it comes to reaching out for investment. I also work alongside VCs and angels in their deal flow and making and helping them make sure that they have that the founders who are submitting their pitches for uh, submission and consideration that it matches their thesis and all the other criteria that you have. So uh, really focused on early stage startups. I don't know why I am a glutton for punishment by staying in that area, but it's really exciting to see all of the change that's being created in the world. Uh, should I begin my presentation? All right, let me share my yes, screen. Perfect. Also, Diane, just to give you some, uh, we have here with us, some here are business angels. We also have uh, founders and some of them are also um, leaders of Core Angels funds. So as you said, they have been in contact with many founders and startups, evaluating that uh, and also seeing many great ideas and projects and teams. Um, some of them have invested in companies that are um, approaching the U.S. market, getting funded in the, in the U.S. market. So um, they would be very interested in learning from you about how things are going there. OK, oh. thank you. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, yes. And, and I, I hopefully am going to speak on that, but um, any additional questions, I guess we'll save those to the end. Just a quick, does this go? There we go. Quick agenda for my portion of the presentation today. And thank you all for your time uh, I, uh, to, to listen to, to the presentation through Core Angels today. Quick recap on what got us here. I want to walk us through the last few years, the hype, the craziness, the highs, the lows, the crying, everything that has happened over the last few years and bring us to 2024 and what I am looking for in, in 2024 and what I'm hearing from other investors and other founders for what 2024 is going to look like. The word I'm going to use is competitive. That seems to be the name that we're that that we're assigning to 2024. I want to then take what uh, that backdrop is and show how that is affects it, how that is affecting investment criteria. What that means for uh, what how investors are looking at restructuring their portfolio and what that means for investors and how they are looking at founders and, and the criteria that they're wanting to see in those founders going into 2024 and into 2025. I'll, I'll hint on that a bit too. AI was a really big topic for 2023 and I just want to set some ground rules for where I'm seeing AI, where it's going, where it's heading. Uh, are we in a bubble? Are we not? Uh, so there's some interesting information ar around that industry. And then finally talk about how to access the uh, U.S. capital and what that means if you are wanting to co-invest alongside U.S. investors, uh, what that means, and how founders can establish a presence here in the U.S., what the U.S. is looking for from international founders. What got us here? How did we get here? 
2021, it was a party. There was so much money flowing in the system. Here in the U.S., $330 billion was invested into startups, and that was across all stages. This was a record-breaking year for venture across multiple facets. Valuation skyrocketed. There was so much money getting put in. Money was cheap quote unquote, money was cheap. Everybody had an exit. We had so many IPOs here in the US. It was a banner year for those exits. Unicorns everywhere. In fact, there were so many unicorns, we had to create a new term, decacorn, because that's now what founders needed to be was a $10 billion company. The, the billion dollar companies, that was so 2020. You needed to be a decacorn in 2021. And to have this uh, backdrop of what's going on in the US to make a lot of this happen, low interest rates. So limited partners and angels in order to get a competitive return on their investment really were willing to take the risk of this boom time in 2021 and put their money there. It, uh, it seemed like that was the best place in order to get funds. Nothing could go wrong. We are just on the up, up, up. Now 2022 hits, the bubble bursts. All of a sudden, everything starts seeming like it's tumbling down. We have a lot of, um, things going on in the world that's shifting how investors are wanting to look at their capital. Uh, only, I say only, $200 billion was invested in companies in the U.S. That's still a lot, especially compared to 2018, 2019 levels, but it's still a third less than what we saw in 2021. So that is a really big difference. Because of that, and investors getting a little nervous with their money, valuation started to tumble down. What that meant was now companies did not want to raise additional funds, additional rounds, because they would be down rounds or flat rounds. Nobody wanted to exit because they weren't able to get the return that their investors were looking for. Uh, unicorns disappeared. All of a sudden, the, this year of the decacorns is now almost in the distant past. Fewer unicorns were created in 2021 than in years previous. So that, that mystical creature suddenly goes into hiding again. Well, what's happening in the background in the US? We have rising interest rates. So we are starting to see how this imbalance is creeping into the macroeconomic systems here in the US. 2023, most people thought 2023 was going to be a difficult year, and in a lot of ways it was, but it ended up being a big mess. Only $140 billion was invested into startups. Again, that's a lot of money going into startups, but it's still another third less than we saw the year previous. Because of what's happening and, and investors aren't wanting to invest in companies, they're sitting on a lot of dry powder. So there's about $300 billion in dry powder that's available that isn't being deployed. A lot of investors, instead of using that money for new startups, they're having to reinvest into their existing portfolio. So we're not seeing that capital being returned back into the ecosystem. A lot of that is going to the existing portfolio to keep those companies default alive in a lot of ways. So it, 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 it was very strange. We also had, we still didn't have any exits because the valuations weren't there. Startups were closing. There were hundreds of thousands of layoffs at very big companies. And I'm sure you saw a lot of that too. And so, and all of this is coupled with high inflation and high interest rates it became more economically feasible 
for investors to put money into more secure funds like U.S. Treasuries than to go the high risk route of investing in startups. A lot of uh, investment funds saw negative returns for 2023. Meanwhile, in the US, we were expecting a recession. We've been expecting a recession for about 18 months now, and it doesn't seem to happen. Our stock market saw record highs. So it was a bit, again, this imbalance is coming into play where for for those investors, institutional investors, retail investors, if they had stayed in the stock market, they would have seen better returns than than investing into into startups in general on those funds. The shining star in this is early stage. So I have on here early stage for the win. In a lot of ways, early stage was sheltered from all of this hype around mega rounds not happening and valuations tanking because there's still money at the early stage. And for those in big, the big investors who could no longer invest in the series D, E, F, your alphabet soup, they went earlier into the startup journey and are now putting money into the early stage. So there's money there. And I think that that will see that trend continue into 2024. But I think that that shows a really big advantage for early stage investors and angels. The, the ball is in your court in a lot of ways because this is where the concentration is and this is where the focus is. I came across this uh, diagram here recently from Carta. I think it really shows the disparity between pre-seed investments, which is 50% higher than in 2021 compared to the later stage rounds. Even looking at Series E, down 90% from just two years ago. So where is the money going? It's all going to the early stages. What does that mean? Competition. It's a great time for companies to start, but it's a very scary and difficult time for them to grow. We still don't have the, the mega funds and all of that large capital to fund the later stages, but we do have the money for the early stage. Really what I'm seeing for 2024, and this is my crystal ball, uh, is a right sizing of the market. If you look at charts from where investment was in 2018, 2019, uh, in some respects, 2020, that's where we are now. So 2021 and 2022 were the outliers. It's just that all of the information and data is looking at that anomaly. And that's not that's not real. So we are seeing the right sizing in the market. We're becoming more realistic and back to where we should have been had the trend continued from the 17, 18, 19 uh, years. Pre-seed investment will continue to rebound uh, because there's just a lot of stability that we're seeing in that market. And a lot of these founders were uh, had their uh, uh, were ideating their their startup during the boom times of 2021, very sheltered within COVID. And so now they're at a point where they have been able to spend enough time to gain traction. So we are going to see uh, an uptick in pre-seed um, and in some respects, seed investment rounds. There's more early stage funds though. Because of what happened in 2021, a lot of people got interested in starting their own venture capital funds. So we have a lot of new emerging fund managers. They're now seeking funds for their portfolios and they're wanting to invest in companies. So we have this next gen VCs, the, the micro VCs. Again, we're filling that gap between the bootstrappers and that initial round that keeps getting pushed out. So there's going to be more competition for funds in that area. 
Here in the U.S., I do see inflation and interest rates starting to stabilize, but we really won't know what that's going to look like until about Q3. So here in the U.S., we're still in this holding pattern where uh, the economy is looking to be a, a flat, if not slightly better year, but a lot of, but it's still going to depend on our government on where those interest rates are going to be to see what is going to be the most competitive place for investors to put their money. Should they continue to, to keep it in US treasuries and get a guaranteed amount or go into the high risk startup? I do think that we are going to be in a more risk on environment for 2024, but it's not, it's definitely not going to be the crazy days of 2021. We'll also see more exits happening this year in the U.S. Because we had no exits over the last two years, there is a, there is a backlog uh, of IPOs that are waiting to happen there's also going to be a lot more M&As as well. So we're, we're going to see that activity. That is going to bode very well going into 2025 because we will be able to return some money back to those funds and really kickstart. So I think 2024 is still going to be kind of in limbo, but on the uh, looking to to improve. So the way I look at it is investors are cautious, but optimistic for 2024. What does this mean for investors? Well, it's really hard to raise new funds. And, and I'm sure a lot of these pain points are shared not just amongst U.S. investors, but as I'm talking to investors around the world, they're seeing this as well. Because of the market we're in, a lot of that capital is going to safer and it, safer investment vehicles as opposed to startups. So it's really hard for those investors to raise new rounds uh, and those low fund returns. Investors and limited partners are, are looking at the funds and saying, hey, you've got my money. Uh, you're sitting on my money, you haven't deployed my money, and I got a re negative return uh, in the double digits last year, I could have invested this in the S&P and received a 24% uh, uh, yield on, on, my, um, on my funds. So what's going on? We're also seeing that record number of VCs, the, uh, and this is going to create a limited capital environment for founders. I still don't think it's going to, that. I still think that the power rests with the investors, even though there's more competition. Uh, so unlike 2021, where it seemed like the power was with the founders, uh, but there is going to be a lot uh, more focus on getting the founders into the right working with the right investors and they have an opportunity to be more choosy in who they work with if they are choosy about their investors, which I, I hope that they are. I'm also seeing investors and angels wanting to diversify their portfolio. And this has been happening, uh, really I've been noticing it over the last six months and didn't realize how big of a trend it is. Uh, a lot of investors are seeing that their core thesis, that that is not necessarily what was needed in order to get the returns that they were wanting for and anticipating for their fund. So now they're looking to diversify in a few ways. They're looking to diversify from a geography standpoint. So I am seeing a lot more interest in how to work with US, a lot of cross-border angels, uh, that type of environment. Also, uh, investors wanting to ex expand outside of their industry of focus. Uh, we saw that, and I'll get into it with the, the ones, I'm doing one slide on AI. You'll have to bear with me for one slide. But that's why we saw a lot of that hype bubble for AI is investors wanting to find that new shiny object as their, as their portfolio is going down. Where can we get a quick win? And, and so they're looking to diversify outside of that for good or for bad, um, but that's, that's what happened. I'm also seeing a more um, uh, a higher a higher um, 
consideration around diversity of teams. So diversity, not just DEI, but also location of teams, diverse teams, remote work is here to stay, especially in the early stage startup. Uh, talent is everywhere. So uh, I'm seeing a lot of investors wanting to look at the team and not just where uh, the founding team is located, but where else are they sourcing the talent? The investment criteria has changed and I, I wanted to leave this slide in here for the founders who are on this call, but also for those of you who are helping founders determine their best strategy for raising capital. There's going to be fewer deals and those deals need to be highly selective. So unlike the heyday of 2021, where it was a me too type party, oh, this industry is going gangbusters. We just need a company in that category. Now it's no, we need the company in that category. So it's we're, we're only seeing category winners. Investors are looking for those category winners. What does that mean? It means the founders and the startups that have a very strong and unique value proposition. Something that's their secret sauce is something that can withstand all of the competition. I'm working with founders to help them create those defensive moats. Uh, there's a lot more discussion around intellectual property and patents and how to build uh, a, a patent strategy as part of your defensibility. There's a lot more interest in building communities. How do how can founders really have that defensive moat? And I'm seeing that from investors too, where they really want to know that these startups are going to withstand competition and compete with the incumbents. What's also going to factor into this is, is founders need deep industry experience. And this is where I think it's very advantageous for angels and for investors at the early stage, because you have that boots on the ground industry experience. Here in the US, most of the investors, whether it's angels or VCs, most of the investors are former startup operators and, store and startup founders. So they have not only the industry experience, but also the business experience as well. And I really think that that focus is what's needed in order for these startups to create these category defining uh, uh, businesses uh, in the industry. As if founders didn't have enough to worry about, traction is still very important. We have been seeing investors increasing the amount of traction required prior to investment. That trend is not going away. We really want those founders to prove that customers are engaged, that they love the product, and that they are buying the product. Gone are the days where it's spend money just for customer acquisition and we'll figure we'll figure out how to monetize later that's a tomorrow problem that's that's no longer the case and that leads into point number three the clear path to revenue we're seeing a renewed interest in having strong unit economics and wanting simple scalable revenue models I'm telling founders, your pitch needs to be exciting and concise and compelling, but your revenue model slide needs to be super boring because that there can't be any, any inkling of any weirdness in how you are going to gain money because it just needs to be a super clear path. We can't rely on just getting users and figuring out what to do with them later. One quick slide on AI and then we'll leave it alone. 2023 was the year of AI and we had a lot of money going into AI, especially towards the end of the year. Market value skyrocketed. What does this mean for 2024? A lot of people are saying bubble. What bubble? It was just a factor of these valuations coming down and investors wanting to find the next best thing, the next greatest thing, and FOMO happened and it took off. 
2024 here in the U.S., we have different regulations here. We're a little behind here in the U.S. on some things. But a lot of investors are saying, what are now the risks associated with AI? So we're taking a step back and instead of putting money in to a sector that we think was super hot, it's, okay, we got burned in 2021. How are we going to really look at AI as a strategy and as part of our portfolio? Uh, there's going to be a lot of excitement in the health tech industry, biotech, climate tech. So I think that works really well, especially for international founders, uh, because there's a lot going on there. Um, but I also think that investors are having to weigh their their funds on do we how do we want to deploy capital for ai ai as for the for the companies that are are going to be more of the uh, industry defining businesses it's very capital intensive so that's going to favor the big tech the existing tech companies and not those scrappy startups so we're going to be finding a balance there again i think this goes into the right sizing of the market. Uh, I include this chart from Gartner. They just put this out, I think, a week or two ago. And they're saying that we are at the top of the hype cycle for generative AI, for prompt engineering and everything that you've been hearing in the news. They're saying, no, this isn't the start of a trend. We're at the top of the trend. So I will let you determine what uh, how, how you want to interpret that, but I think that that's that they did pull it together when I'm seeing the rest of the market. How do you want to access U.S. capital? How does this work? Assuming everything I told you, you're saying yes, I still want to do this. First. I really want to take a second to look at the strategy behind behind fundraising. What is that fundraising strategy and is the U.S. going to be part of that strategy? So why it's it's really asking yourself and founders, why do you want to be part? Why do you want to gain capital from the United States? A lot of founders I talk to say, Diane, I just want money from whomever and wherever I don't care. And there's no wrong way except for that one. So don't do that. But in thinking about your strategy, your long-term vision for your company, why do you want to do why do you want to have a presence here in the US? Maybe your industry is less regulated here. That would be an important factor for for wanting to to uh, do business here in the US and setting up a presence here in the US. Are you planning to gain or are you gaining traction, meaningful revenue generating traction in the US? That's an important factor. Also, because founders are needing to have that deep industry experience, where are they going to find that experience? Is that network in the US? So, and again, mentioning that most of the investors here are former operators. So where is that network going to come from? So it's not so much why, because there's money here, but it's deeper than that. Is it part of your business, uh, business strategy and your business model? I have to ask founders, where? Where are you wanting to raise the money? Are you wanting to raise money just in the US or from or from multiple countries. This really affects how you want to set up your business entity. A lot of founders still want to go after non-dilutive grants. We saw a lot more grants become available post COVID, but grants want you to be involved locally. So here in the US, Colorado is a great state for grants, but they want that money and that revenue and that impact to be in the state of Colorado. So you can't say that you are going to have a presence here and a presence here and a presence here and a presence here and expect that the grant money is going to come. What, we, what I was seeing is that some founders were wanting to uh, take advantage of the capital here in the U.S. and then they realized that most of the grants that they could apply for were in their were in their native country. It's really hard to go back and forth. So really think about where do you want to raise your funding. 
Who do you want to raise your funding from? Do you want to raise funding just from accredited investors or is non-accredited okay and you want to go the crowdfunding route? Uh, that can define your strategy as well. Um, and in, here in the U.S. to invest alongside the U.S. investors, you do have to be an accredited investor. There is some rumors that the definition of accredited investor is going to change for 2024. This is something that we're all kind of watching. It's looking like that um, net worth threshold is going to adjust with inflation, but also we're trying to get inflation down in our country. So there's some discussion going on on what that looks like. Just be aware that that definition may change. And when should you consider inve uh, uh, gaining investment from, th from the, the US? You really have to figure out your strategy now. It becomes more complex once you hire employees. It becomes more complex once you have meaningful revenue. So because it gets more complicated as you grow, uh, again, as if founders had enough to worry about, they really have to think long-term strategy, how do we want to do this? And they need to figure out a strategy now because it, and they have to start building their network now because it gets a lot more difficult as they go. If you, if, if all of that sounds appealing to you, uh, then this is, this is the high level how I'm not a lawyer, so uh, I can't go into all of the details and regulations, but how can companies establish that presence and, and receive funding from U.S. investors? The uh, most, uh, the best practice is to do what's called a Delaware flip. And this is where companies flip their, their, their existing companies into a Delaware C Corp. Delaware C Corps are still the gold standard here in the United States. I don't care what Elon Musk says about Delaware C Corps. He has his own things to worry about. Delaware C Corps are still the gold standard. That's what founders need to be. Most investors will require that US based entity in order to invest in the company. For those founders who want to do the Delaware flip, they also have to have the right to live and work in the US. So they can't just file the paperwork. They also have to make sure that they meet all of the regulations to have the right to live and work in the US. Another consideration is that investors need to be accredited. And, um, and, and so, and I already talked about some of the changes that might happen later in the year. It's also expected for founders that they will need to move their operations here in the United States. They need to establish some kind of a headquarters here. They need to have employees here. They need to be gaining local traction. And, and so that's a consideration as well. And that's part of that right to uh, live and work here in the U.S. Syndicates, this is a great way to get involved. I think that uh, syndicates are going to become more popular because angels are wanting to diversify their strategy. A great way to, to diversify is to look at what other angels are doing. So sharing in the due diligence, I think is a great way. I do have to put in a plug for Rocky's Venture Club. This is a, a resource you may not be familiar with. Rocky's Venture Club is right here in Colorado. They are the oldest angel network in the United States. They're also one of the most active. They only invest in U.S. in U.S. based companies, but I mention them because they have a lot of educational information for investors and for founders. And so they can be a really great spot. Um, they have uh, an angel capital conference uh, coming up in person in March. Colorado has I, uh, just a quick plug for Colorado. We have a lot of resources for founders and international founders. We have an international airport. We have a World Trade Center. We are, um, have our, our government is very supportive of startups and businesses. We're the number one state for female founded companies. So it's there's just a lot going on with Colorado, but I digress. Key takeaways today, besides Colorado being very amazing, is that 2024 will be tough. It will be competitive. Uh, 
uh, that investors are looking for the best companies, not that they weren't before, but I think that it's uh, going to become even harder to find those best companies. 2024 will favor those solid companies. So the founders who are creating, they're solving big problems and they're doing it in a very novel way and it just makes sense. Those are going to be the companies that are going to rise to the top. We are seeing a return to fundamentals, which I think again, favors very well for early stage investors and angels because that's the sweet spot anyway, is finding those very strong companies. And there's opportunities here in the US. Uh, let's build the next great company together uh, and, and uh, just make sure that these founder, founders around the world are able to rise to their fullest potential. Thank you for your time. Welcome to connect with everybody on LinkedIn. Send me an email. Happy to help your founders get investor ready. Happy to chat about what Founder Institute can do for your founders. Um, there's probably a Founder Institute chapter near you. We're in about 200 cities. Uh, that's it. Mm -hmm.